Ouch. Now everyone knows it's recording. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, very nice that you have set aside some time to join us today. We're going to talk about uh, digital transformations. And we have a great honor to have Dave Snowden with us today uh, in the group, in the panelists. Uh, and he's going to discuss with our colleague from uh, Finland, Martin, about this topic. And facilitating the discussion today is also my colleague Peter from, from South Africa. My name is Sofia, and as usual, I'm going to be here fiddling around in the background uh, during the webinar. Uh, and I will be back with, with the questions. And we are really looking forward to you guys also being active and asking us questions and commenting on, on the topic in the chat. So feel free to chat with us throughout. Uh, the recording will also be shared on our social media and also in an email to you guys who are here today. So uh, stay tuned for that also afterwards. And this you can share around with people who missed us live. I think that's it from my side, uh, panelists and attendees in the chat, everyone, so that we can we can talk with each other. And uh, Peter, I'm going to hand it over to you, and then maybe the guys can also introduce themselves. Thanks, Pia. Um, so welcome, everybody, from my side as well, and particularly warm welcome to Dave Snowden, the somebody most many of you know, I'm sure, um, the father of the Kinevan framework, um, done a lot of work in the space of complexity and uh, a friend of Agile 42 and, and uh, um, an advisor to us in many, many occasions. And then also a warm welcome to my colleague, Martin, Martin van Weissenberg, Agile coach from Agile 42 in Finland, um, whom I've had the pleasure of knowing for a number of years now. So gentlemen, I'm gonna dive in with some kind of warm up questions around this topic of digital transformation. Um, and I'm going to probably ask each of you to answer in turn from your own perspective, a couple of things uh, around it. I'm gonna start with, you know, what is digital transformation? Let's make sure that we are, uh, have the same idea of what the topic is. Martin, shall we start with you? Yeah, that's fine. Thanks. So what is digital transformation? Um, basically, it's um, if you look it up, uh, you will find that it's uh, the act or the process of replacing um, processes, ways of working, ways of collecting information with uh, digital variants. And, uh, and there's a bunch of ways to do that. You can do it kind of naively. You take whatever you have on paper and you just, you know, translate that to on top of a database or something. And, uh, and you try to make it look nice, but you don't make any changes to the underlying process. And then at the other extreme, which is where things do get interesting is when you are actually building new processes and new ways of, of making money uh, based on what the, what the digital tools can offer you. And that's, that's where things get interesting. And that's where you need kind of a different outlook on things. That's okay. my take. Thanks, Martin. Dave, what would you say? Uh, if you put the two words together, then it's just another excuse for consultants to make a lot of money for doing something you'll have to replace in three years time, right? I mean, we've been digitizing things since I was programming on mainframe computers in the 1980s. All right, what, what, what digitization is a tool. The tools are more sophisticated, they're faster, we can do more things with them. We've got more pervasive technology available to people so people have different expectations. But fundamentally, digitization isn't a transformation, it's what relationship we want with your customers, which could be transformative. And digitization may or may not take a place in that. In actual fact, analog can be more useful and human can be more useful in certain contexts. Okay. So if it's just an excuse, or maybe this is maybe this is the answer, if it's an excuse for consultants. The latest excuse, Peter, right? <laughs> they they need a new one every two years, all right? Then you know, why is it why is is it such a hot topic? Is is that the reason or are there others? 
No, I think, um, I mean, you see the pattern in this. I mean, I've observed it since the 80s and we have whole complexity theory based on it. Um, sorry, I'll just get esoteric for a bit. Uh, one of the things we're now starting to see argued in physics is that information has mass. And if that is the case, it doesn't just account for dark matter, it actually gives us an explanation for things like this, because you have mass, you have momentum. So there is a desire, and it's been built in since the 80s, to do transformation. You know, we had it with business process re-engineering, with learning organization, with the Six Sigma, with Blue Ocean Strategy, Red Oceans. You know, there's this constant need to actually avoid dealing with reality and talk about things which will transform us so in two years' time everything will be better. And that's become an ingrained pattern of response. Right? Now, having said that, it doesn't mean that we should neglect it. There was a huge amount of value in business process re-engineering, slightly less than Six Sigma. Very little value in learning organization or Blue Ocean strategy, but a huge amount within Agile and TQM. And I could go through all of these. So I think there isn't any particular reason for any of them. It's just something suddenly gets attention, it gets picked up, it gets amplified. It gets talked about when CEOs to get together. And I always used to say the only reason anybody did the BPR was because they met another C CEO on the golf course who said, I'm doing a SAP transformation. And they thought, I better do one too. So I, I, I'm literally being that cynical, but I think that's what happens. All right. And I think really clever companies, yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, one of the clients I've worked on with you in Agile, in um, you know, the telecoms company in Stuttgart. They don't follow those fad cycles. They actually look at technology as something which can provide usefulness to people. And it's an incremental approach. It's an opportunity-based approach. It's not a, oh, my God, we've got to do this. But if you're in that cycle, well, there are good and bad ways to do it. Okay. And so um, maybe, Martin, to come, to come back to you, what, what do you see that people do right and that people do wrong with digital transformation well i'd like to tack on to what dave said but uh, and and i think it's also a question of a, it's a it's a learning journey right so it's easy to somehow and simple and non-threatening to start out with the with kind of naive um transformations of of going basically analog to digitized uh, versions just because you well because you you met another ceo at the golf course and 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 learned that this is the thing to do right but um smart companies over time they they learn so they they try out we all need to start somewhere uh, regardless of whether it's golf or whether it's a digitalization or, or, or playing an instrument or, or becoming more agile there's an impetus there's a driver for something and then i think people will will just need to to learn um and uh, and pick pick things up as they go and one of the no-nos one of the mistakes that companies do is that they don't learn they don't they they just go on they they make assumptions and they go on basically what naive naive digitalization uh, and, and and end up basically nowhere they end up with different ways of of doing the same things instead of taking the opportunities that they could take. I'd, I'd make a general point as well, Peter. I mean, these things come in waves. And as any surfer will tell you, when a wave comes, you need to stay mobile and go with it. So whether I think the waves are a good idea or not, or whether McKinsey's have got a wave generating machine 100 yards offshore that they trigger from time to time, which I'm increasingly convinced they do, the reality is when the wave comes in, I think this is where Agile comes into play, you need to pick up on that wave and you need to make sure it does something useful yeah rather than just lapse into yet another initiative so a wave is an opportunity yeah, regardless of its source mm -hmm. i like that analogy it's a, it's a good one especially the mckinsey's wave generator huh? that's all you yeah <laughs> I, I love that one <laughs> it's not it's not limited to mckinsey i suppose they they may be selling wave generator uh, templates to other companies, as far as I know. <laughs> Today is McKinsey bashing day, it seems. All right. I guess we could pick any big consulting company um, and replace the name. Um, so one of the things that both of you talked about uh, in, in, the, in the 
lead up video was the connection between agile and and digital transformation. So, you know, a question we should explore is, is you know, can agile enable digital transformation or the other way around? How, how do we see the connection or relationship between the two? Martin. Okay. Um, so I, I'd rather say that digital is agile, agile is digital. It's, it's so, uh, I mean, Digitalization, digital tools enable you, in many cases, to move fast uh, to, because you can repeat, you can get so much more done with the uh, push of a button compared to, to many analog methods. Analog methods do have their, their upsides, of course, but, uh, but sometimes you would like to, to push one button and get a thousand things rolling at once. And that's what, uh, what digital gives to, to, to agile, basically. So it's an enabler for agile. But I also, I like the, it's just to return to the wave an analogy. So when the, when the wave is coming, let's say, call it the digitalization wave for, for I don't know where, why or where that, that wave has been originated. It could be that there's somebody at a big consulting company pushing, pushing a button somewhere and, and the wave is generated. But when, when it comes, if you are, if you are agile, you, you'll be able to surf. It'll take you forward. It'll take you to, to new waters. And if you're not, you might get uh, um, swamped by the wave or you might be able to go like three meters and then you're bloop somewhere or you might even drown if the wave is big enough. So they say it's a question of being uh, having having that balance and being able to shift your balance sometimes and staying on top of the wave and and a little bit ahead of the wave but but kind of riding riding that wave as it comes so yeah. it also depends i mean agile is these days a sort of many-headed beast right um and whether it's a hydra or a whack-a-mole game i'm never sure but yeah you, you've got sort of scrum type fast iteration processes you've got kanban type processes you've got and we won't go into nonsense like safe, all right? You've got value chain mapping, which is now starting to displace agile. So agile isn't, isn't a harmonious approach, right? If we look at agility as a general concept, which I think is where we need to go, the issue is what, and we talk about this in terms of vectors, all right? So it's what speed, what direction of travel for what energy consumption. So there are times where you need to do the scrum type very fast iteration because you don't know what's possible. Yeah, There are times where you need to map out the value chain and focus on where digitization will improve value or remove blockages. That's kind of like another approach. The area we work is, is where, for example, you need to map unarticulated customer needs or employee needs and then find ways in which digitization could realize an unarticulated need. And that's always what Apple did brilliantly. Nobody they knew they needed smartphones till Apple created one, yeah? So I think we, we need to get a portfolio type approach to this rather than just saying, you need to be digitally agile, you need to be agile. There are different types of agility that you need in different contexts. So the, the key question is what's the velocity? You know, what's the vector? Um, and to what degree is the area known? So there's, there's a metaphor here I'm using a lot these days, which Greg, by the way, I want to talk to you about, is we're talking to, trying to talk much more about C charts than we are about maps. Because a C chart, you kind of like know where there's granite cliffs and you don't need to resurvey them more than every 50 years. But the sandbanks, you need to survey every day and the currents may change at different tidal things. So what you need to do is to create a C chart to find out what's certain, what's predictable, what's highly volatile. Then you need to select the appropriate agile tools to match that particular situation. And digitization then carries on from those tools. Yeah, It's not the thing, you, you know, it's the hammer seeking the nail to use the cliche, right? Digitization is a means to an end. And it's quite noticeable. I mean, some of the really good digital, most of the really good digitized services these days have a highly responsive online chat where you can talk to a human being right now that's actually a use of digitization which actually makes analog available and it removes some of the issues with wide-scale automation if you give the chat line people the authority to do things which are in the tail of a distribution because your process map the thing you've digitized 
will be based on the center generally of a normal distribution. And people's experiences are often in a tale of a Pareto distribution. So that's where you need to introduce human agency, but not just human agency, you need human agency with authority. And I think that's one of the big things people are missing on digitization. Okay. So I want to talk about a couple of um, um, topical elements that come into it. So, you know, COVID is the obvious one. So what we've learned from talking to customers um, over the last more than a year is that where people were previously, many of them skeptical about work from home, um, now it's kind of de facto accepted by everybody that that's going to continue. And somewhere between 50%, 80%, even higher, uh, people will spend that percentage of their time working from home. So is there, a, is there any link between that or, or is that driving digital transformation? Can digital transformation make that work better? Is there a link or is it, is it just spurious in my head? It's given us a lot of new tools, all right? And some tools are better than others, all right? So to be quite honest, I wince when I get sent to Microsoft Teams invitation. And I hold my hands up in despair if it's Google Teams because I have to go and find the headphones. Whereas with Zoom, I can almost just have a conversation without thinking about it. Yeah. So one of the problems we've got is people aren't using the right tools. They're following corporate procurement processes, which aren't often flexible enough. So you can provide better tools. But we had two meetings in the last month because lockdown's partially over here. And in five hours with 15 people, we got more done than we got in any number of Zoom calls over the, over the previous six months. So I think this is the hybrid working. It's, it comes back to velocity. It's what do you do in what context and when do you do it? Right. And we're now experimenting with hybrid events in which we'll have people physically present who will represent virtual clusters. Yeah. So that you've got the, and I think we're getting much more sophisticated about different ways of working and using technology in that context. But we know that, for example, olfactory sense or smell is actually really important on human trust decisions. And the ability to pick up weak signals in a physical group is much easier for humans than in a virtual group. Yeah. So I think it's it's a both and it's not an either or. Yeah. And there's also significant issues over class and availability. I mean, I'm sitting here on Zoom looking out into a garden which looks onto fields with sunshine and I can walk into the kitchen to get a coffee and I've got all my books around me. That's completely different from somebody stuck on a bed in a one bedroom flat sit because all, that's all they can afford. Yeah, and actually we might be better creating nodal physical spaces for them with proper hygiene. Yeah, because the one thing we know for certain is that COVID is not gonna be over anytime soon and most of us working in the field are seeing we're going to see waves of lockdown and lockdown, but we'll never, there's never going to be a return to normal. So we need these much more fluid arrangements. That's, I agree. I also see kind of a trend where um, most of the innovations happen in a kind of war or ongoing war between, let's say, Teams and, uh, and Zoom and so on. So they try to, to add whatever the competitors added a month ago, they tried to, to be there and maybe push the uh, envelope a little bit, but it's it's all kind of evolutionary step by step. And I'm kind of lacking somehow a revolutionary thing. How, how about why are we not moving into virtual reality where where possibly your, your surroundings don't matter as much? You could just be sitting in a closet, for example. Um, they do. I, I mean, so, sorry, we, we, we went through this in the 80s and 90s in massive labs, all right? Experimenting with virtual reality and walking into spaces. Second life yeah. collapsed completely as a corporate tool because you're not getting the same stimulation you get in the physical environment. The yeah. human, human yeah. brain and body evolved at quite complex simulation, some of which we don't fully understand. And you don't get that in virtual reality and you don't get it in Zoom. Uh, it doesn't mean yeah. you can't do it in it. It makes life a lot easier, but but yeah. Yeah, agreed. I, I picked this up as a, as one example. Maybe it wasn't the best example, but there might be might be others. There, there's now 
Uh, I just read about, for example, kind of TikTok style. You record something, send it off to your colleague, and they can answer at, at their leisure, basically, when they have time. Um, and, and all of these things, it's taken us uh, more than a year to, to get to these kind of things. Are we just slow? Uh, is there kind of a, a velocity of change that people just, you know, beyond that, people are not going to pick up new things? So, um, and, and, and I'm sorry to be depressing on you, but it's also created a new set of cyber security problems because right. you, yeah, you increasingly right. digitize, digitize communication. It's much easier for the hacks to actually find things and start to feed false information into your system. In fact, we know that's already going on. So digitization carries significant dangers in terms of cyber security. And again, people are rushing into things. It's like, you know, we rush into something, then we don't think it through, then we have to do something. It's constant band-aid because we haven't got the velocity right in the first place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it might be, it might be. Um... So, yes, so I'm, I'm picking up that there is a lot of stuff um, related to, to COVID, but it's not necessarily got anything to do with the digital transformation. Um, let me pick up something else that I, I, interesting, I was on a plane trip this morning and I picked up the, the local business um, newspaper, which I've, which I've got here, an article about firms need to re-engineer jobs to handle the fallout from, from automation. So they weren't using the word digital transformation, but it really struck me as being roughly the same thing. And the, th and the thing that I was wondering about w was this. The, the, I, I need to make a couple of observations. So firstly, I need to observe that all three of us are male, and so we're unqualified to talk about what I'm about to, what I'm about to talk about. So that's a caveat. Um, secondly, what was observed in the, in the article is that in the last decades, a lot of women have entered the workplace but many of them have been given, have taken on jobs because the playing fields are not level, that are kind of administrative, repetitive, the kinds of jobs that are open to um, automation. And therefore, while in theory, progress has been made with more women coming into the workplace, if, if many of those jobs get replaced by in digital transformation, isn't that going to then have a negative effect on trying to level the playing field for women in the workplace? So what are your comments? And, and if you think it's true, what can we do? I mean, the, the cannabis company, which is what we're now calling Cognitive Ed, is about 90% female, um, which actually is a really interesting dynamic, right? Um, and you can see the behavioral differences because it's a different type of authority in terms of the way it works. But that's largely because it is 90% female and it's sort of grown up together. I work with female vice presidents in IBM who were more patriarchal than the males. Yeah, so one of the, the things that it, it, it's context matters, all right? The, the cultural context of your company is a more powerful determinant of individual behavior than their own gender or their own class. Yeah? It's, it's the old culture eats, eats strategy for breakfast. It also eats gender for breakfast, right? Um, and you can see that. I mean, you know, people thought that the one place in the company where the glass ceiling has been removed is HR, but what's the most angry retentive bureaucratic department in most companies, it's HR. So you, you didn't get any change in behavior. If anything, it got worse. So I think the, the management context, the physical context is more important to say than gender, but we need to start to work on different balancing items. In your general question, part of the problem is, and this is a general problem for society, we're losing low skill tasks, but we're not reducing low skill people. So the, if, if you end up with an unemployed, unskilled workforce in large numbers, that's where you get populism and that's where you get fascism. So for example, I mean, I'm, I'm getting depressed about this. We've got a song which we're all meant to sing in the UK tomorrow, which sounds to me like something straight out of the Hitler youth. Yeah, in the, in the 1930s, you know, it's kind of like, you know, one land, right? One folk. I mean, it is literally that sort of form. And that's been circulated by a populist government into a it's that sort of what Marx called, or right? I'm not Marxist in that sense, the opiate of the people. 
So I think we've got to address at a society level how we find meaningful engagement for people who can't actually compete in that technology environment. And it's not just education that we need to level that up. Some people will not be able to. Right? And, and, and we're not addressing that. And it's a responsibility for companies as well. Martin? Yeah, this, is a, this is a thought that occurred to me too. I've seen it more like a cutoff point, but I, I realized that it's a slippery slope. It's a slide, it's, it's basically a slope of sorts. And uh, as time passes, as more things get automated, there are more people who probably can't, can't pick things up. Um, and and uh, I, w women are probably I, uh, in the wrong place at, at this time. So society is, is not yet ready for gender equality, I suspect. And and that's why we are seeing all kinds of interesting, interesting kind of outcomes. And but it also means that women are more susceptible to to basically being booted out, I suppose. But they also are more resilient, I suppose, being able to to pick up. I think it's men who give up. This now I'm I'm being anecdotal now. But men men who fail to to pick up. There's and, an old there's an old saying which goes back to Kierkegaard, nature may deal the cards, but nurture plays them. Mm. And what happens to you around pu puberty is far more significant than what gender you were. So we, we, we need to start to address that early stage. In fact, early stage education to me is key. And mm. I've argued for a long time that training kids in programming languages is not only a waste of time, it's a bad thing to do because by the time they go to university or college or technical college, the software is going to move, or anything you teach them now will be like when I was at school, we were taught how to use punch cards machines until we'd have a job for life. It's the modern equivalent. Mm -hmm. We need to teach them about design, about thinking, about anthropology, about people, because those skills will persist with them way after technology goes. And we're over-focusing on STEM education at the cost of human education, I think, at the moment. And that will hit us. Okay. So um, I'm going to move on from there. Um, but it strikes me that maybe we should have another webinar on the topic of gender and learning and development and the, some of the things that yes. have come up. And possibly with a, a panel who, who is that is more maybe diverse, mm. <laughs> yeah. I suppose. I can think of many of my colleagues who would be suitable. Okay, so I think um, let's perhaps go to some of the questions. We're about halfway in time wise, and let's see what people are asking so that we can uh, keep this relevant to what the audience is looking for. Sophia, do you want to kick us off with some questions that have come in? Sure, I can take take the first one. Um, this is probably a little bit more of a, not maybe a question, but let's start with this one. Is Agile the destination or part of the journey, a way to become more flexible, adaptive, and responsive, even influence at the core of a network uh, of capabilities in context? Do you want to comment that? I, I famously said at one Agile conference in Scotland that the only thing which was authentic to the spirit of the manifesto was the XP. Yeah, and all the XP people thought I was wonderful and stood up and cheered me. And I, but I said, the problem is nobody in XP can talk to ordinary mortals. So it was never going to scale anyway. And they're all trying to work out whether it was an insult or not. Um, the reality is part of the problem with Agile is that Scrum hit the sweet spot of abstraction and codification. This is going back to Vasso's work. So it distributed very fast. Yeah. And then SAFE picked up on that because Scrum started the whole certification recipe approach. So Scrum itself is not is actually a lot better than that. I mean, we recommend Scrum a lot, but it triggered this mechanism is we need a better recipe and a better certification scheme. And then you get the nonsense of things like SAFE. So actually Agile has become the destination, not the means to achieve the destination. And it's become a way to stifle innovation, just like Six Sigma did to, I famously said at one conference, all right? Um, SharePoint is to knowledge management, what Six Sigma is to innovation and SAFE is to Agile. Yeah, it, it's what happens to something if you don't surf the wave. 
Yeah. I, I really like the way uh, Chris Matz uh, presented this. He wrote in a in a blog post that many many years ago. He wrote that Agile started as a learning community, right? So people were trying out things, sharing that information, and building on top of of what others others did. So it was a a community of of basically trial and error and and helping each other. And that's also the first sentence of the Agile manifesto. You know, by doing it and by helping others do it. So um, I, I like that. And then um, Agile moved on. The Agile, shall we call it the Agile movement, moved on to becoming a, a solutions community. And right now, if you go to an Agile conference, when I, as a consultant, I go to an Agile uh, conference, I'm seeing more Agile consultants than, than anyone else. And everyone has a solution to sell. Call it safe, call it less, call it, uh, you know, anything it is a solution and and uh, it, it will solve all your problems right and i think that's that's another way to to highlight these the, the issues that we are facing and i would so much like to go back to you know trial and error um and that that means yeah. that agile is a, a journey more than a destination right one of the things we're actually about to launch and moving our methods into open source with stage one is we're about to create a multi multi method multi vendor mechanism yeah, for Agile, by which you, you say so you decompose things to the lowest level of granularity. And that allows you to combine and recombine things from safe, from scrum, from lean, from whatever. And I think that's the way to go. We need open source multi-vendor, yeah, multi-method. Um, so we're, we're, I mean, that's a complexity principle. You create a scaffolding, you define your objects, you define the interaction of the objects, and then you allow unique solutions to emerge. And that's much closer to creating materials for chefs. And there's aspects of that are pattern language as well. What you're doing is you're creating patterns at the right level of granularity, yeah, which removes some of the cognitive load. Right? Mm. Yeah, and organic agility is one of the first ones which is coming into that family uh, along with others. So I think that we, we can re-energize this, but I don't think we need to have a name for it. I think names have been the problem. Yeah, like digitization, like Agile, like Sigma, what we want to have is something which starts to emerge bottom up mm -hmm. and takes all the things which have happened over the last 20 years and starts to put them together in different combinations. So if I do this, I could, for example, take a sprint out of Scrum and replace it with a three month time box. Now, actually, then you've got a very different method, but you've still got the benefits of both. And that's kind of like the way certainly we're starting to go. And, and we think the industry needs to go. Yeah, agreed, it's, agreed. People want um, recipes. I'm reminded of Alistair Coburn's crystal, which was a whole family of methods from a very light method to a very heavy, heavy method, but people didn't, in my um, experience, want to take the time to, to go through the necessary learning of the principle. Mm. Martin, you were saying something. Uh, no, nothing, nothing specific. Uh, I was just kind of reflecting that a um, by by gaining experience, maybe this is what what uh, people are doing. Um, companies that are successful in in adopting agile methods or kind of going on that learning journey, that's that's what they are doing. So they are exploring and they're experimenting, and they are somehow picking and matching, and sometimes creating new variants by smashing two things together and seeing what what kind of remains or what what it gives rise to so um by, but by having if you have a lot of experience if you've seen a lot of different companies and and what they are doing maybe you might be more effective at, at doing this kind of thing uh, just a, a thought that occurred to me in this in this context okay So there's a question here from uh, Mike Pellier, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly. I'm going to read the comment, the, the preamble first. I see quite radical split in people. Some fully embraced new online hybrid reality, some rejected it. One example, thanks to online, I managed to be I'm a member of a public speaking club in another country, but the club lost some members because of Zoom fatigue. How, and his question is, how is this inequality of perceptions could affect digital transformation. Um, does the question 
Makes sense. Yeah, it resonates a lot. I mean, I, I, I'm suffering two major withdrawal symptoms at the moment. One is I have to read Trump's tweets every morning for the four years he was president. And they're not coming through. And that, that's, I'm, I'm losing my ability for righteous indignation every morning as a result, right? So the sad. other one, I was on, you know, 253 days in hotels speaking at multiple events. And I can tell you, speaking in a Zoom event is not the same thing. You don't get the same feedback. You really don't. So I can see why some people in public speaking would not want to go on to Zoom because it's not a sustainable environment unless you're just delivering a PowerPoint presentation. Right? But if you want to engage the audience, it's very difficult in Zoom. And I keep telling conference organizers, I'm not going to use slides. I, I haven't used slides since Zoom came out you know, for at least the last six months because I want all of those faces up so I can see them and get some response. And slides actually don't help on that. So I, th I think, again, it's this, some things work in different ways, some things won't work. You need to get a balance on things. You need to do things in different ways. And you can see that in sports. I mean, you know, I got my tickets for Wales Summer Internationals this morning. I was online for the key 15 minutes and I grabbed them, right? And I could watch all of that on television, but it's not the same as being there, right? And I, I think you can see this, you know, we're putting up our first public masterclass in October because we think that's the one month you know, when this lockdown finishes before the next one starts. So it's an opportunity. There's a desperate hunger yeah, for that sort of physicality of stimulation in people. And we've, we've got to stop it being an either or. I mean, hybrid means hybrid. It means sometimes you do one thing, sometimes you do another. And different people will need different balances at different times. And we may want to work on a pod type basis. So creating pods for three or four people to work together, for example, rather than the big office. And I think we can get a lot more intelligent about design on this. Mm, agreed. And one thing tacking on again uh, to what you're saying is that what people also enjoy uh, watching is interaction between people. So having one talking head is, is well, it can be interesting, but it's, it's all about one, one topic. But uh, the interactions between a group of people is uh, is important. This is the same thing you see on on television with all the reality shows, basically. That it's all about uh, people negotiating, um, planning, um, you know, bribing others, betraying others. All of those things that that keep people the the the, the viewers interested. So I think that having this kind of discussions or interviews is is much more valuable to people, and that can be to some extent replicated, right? Progress. 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 Peter, I'm seeing you twice. Yeah. Sorry, that was an accident. I'm trying to decide which is the best, the black and white one or the color one. <laughs> uh, the, the color one is smiling more. Okay. Very fun. Um, so here's, uh, here's a question in language that they that I would hear Dave speak. How can we find the adjacent possible in a transformation based on attractions and systems tendency? Uh, that's um, that's what I was talking about earlier. We, we used to talk a lot about landscapes. We're now talking more about sea charts because you have this concept of things which are unknowable and the currents and the things shift, all right? So, and people, I was saying this on an event this morning, people confuse the adjacent possible with the adjacent adjacent. Yeah, they, they, they forget the possible, right? An adjacent possible is an evolutionary landscape. It's not what's next to us. It's also, you know, what's the next feasible state for the right energy input, yeah? And that's where we're using things like constructive theory and physics. So I think the key thing is to map, right? It's kind of like, you know, we, we can map attitudes. It's one of the big things we do as a company because attitudes are lead indicators and they measure culture, right? Um, you need to understand that. You need to understand micro level practice. And I mean, you know, just published the European Commission's Field Guide to Managing Complexity in a Crisis. One of the big things we've talked about in that is rapidly gathering lessons learned over the last two years from your staff on a distributed basis, but using that to map where people are and where they want to go next. And the big thing I'd say on that is you've got to stop thinking 
about homogenized solutions for the whole company. That's what's also driven the fad cycle. We talk about coherent heterogeneity. Different parts of the organization will want to do different things in different contexts, and you have to manage for that, and maps make that easier, right? Um, I mean, if you know, I'm walking next week, all right, and it's a 50 kilometer challenge walk, there are parts of that walk I'll be able to walk quickly and parts where I need to be very careful because there are bogs which would swallow me up, right? So, and sometimes I'm walking with people, so I'm safer, sometimes I'm walking on my own. Context is everything in human systems. And we've got to get into what's called fractal action, all right? So different types of action at different levels, which becomes cohesive as a whole, but isn't the similar all the way around. And the way I normally illustrate that is um, the coherent heterogeneity point is I've just booked my season ticket for Cardiff Rugby Club, right? So I'm back at the Arms Park, thank God, in November, right? Life is restored to normal. I've got opera tickets and I've got rugby tickets again. This is what the Welsh need, all right? We need singing and we need rugby. Um, and that means I can watch Cardiff, yeah, who are now called Cardiff again, who are a highly rational set of players, well-disciplined, well-trained, sometimes put upon by evil referees, yeah? Um, and if we lose, it's not our fault, it's some other bastards, all right? And it's generally those bastards down the road in Flanetley, yeah, who basically are foul-mouthed people who actually cheat all the time and bribe referees, yeah? Um, but when England come, well, God, we're all Welsh, right? And that's coherent heterogeneity. It's the ability to be different, but also then to be similar. And I think that, to me, is a key part of modern organisational design. It's how do you know differences and quite frequently competitive differences, which can actually combine in different ways in different contexts. And in theory, digitization should be a hugely valuable tool to allow that, but it isn't been implemented as an enabler of heterogeneity. It's been implemented as an imposition of homogeneity. And that applies to customer experience as well. So is that not, a fault of our education systems. I don't necessarily mean our school, but beyond that. I mean, university professors, so people go to university and they learn something and then they go into business. So, so what they learned, if they're a manager, they learned at university 20 years ago. The person who taught them learned it 20 years before that. So everybody, cool. you know, the senior people in the organizations are, 40 years or some big number out of date. I, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, I've got an MBA, all right? Um, I mean, it was cool to do it. It got me promoted. It had no goddamn relationship whatsoever to happens in corporate environment. I, I keep trying to explain to, I worked in IBM strategy in Armonk, all right? It's a savage, ruthless political environment. It's not about rational, logical ordered processes that you get taught on the MBA. So I, I think we, it's a more general problem. I think we've lost apprentice schemes. Mm. Uh, I think actually the loss of apprentice schemes in management is a problem. And I remember having that argument with Sam, he wanted to digitize the hell out of middle management. And I said, well, where, where are your next board members gonna come from? Yeah, because actually they've served their apprenticeship. They've run their businesses. They've survived in a difficult environment. That's why they're on your board. For God's sake, I train the top 200 every year for you, all right? And yeah, I can tell you if they didn't have that 15 years experience in middle management, you wouldn't get there, all right? So I think we, we, we need to think of education as ongoing. I'm not sure MBAs are useful, all right? I would force every software engineer to go through ethics training because software engineers are doing things with ethical consequences they're not even aware of. That's what's really scary. They don't even know that what they're doing has those implications. So I think we need to think about education in a much more messy way. And I think we need to combine different things. And I need to, we genuinely need to give people a chance to learn in working with other people from different backgrounds. Yeah, and again, that goes against the certification business and, and, and all of that sort of stuff, which is the bedev bedevilment of our job which creates kind of homogeneity somehow. Anyone with a certified scrum master rubber stamp is, is kind of fitting in the same bin, right? And I still find that hysterical. You do a two day course, you do an open book exam over several weeks and somebody calls you the master of something. I mean, it's, 
just don't take mm. it. And of course, I mean, Dean in Safe. If you if you if you want to want to have a certificate in anything, he'll create a course and give you a certificate, provided you pay for the annual update. I mean, it's that cynical. Okay. Um, Good question, Peter. I don't know if you saw it, it just came in, but how do we keep digitalization relevant to the current masses or the generations now for the next five to 10 years? What skills and services and what not do they need? First of all, don't underestimate, I actually use more apps than my children. Yeah, the older people are often more technologically literate, they're less fat generated, they, they see it as a tool. Um, we've been doing work in working class areas with transgenerational pairing, but in younger people with old people, not to train them to use the technology, but to use the technology together to come up with improvements in their community. So again, the technology is a means to an end, not an end in itself. And I think, you know, some of our work at the moment is to distribute ethnography into schools and church groups at a youth level and engage adults with those children in working out where they should go in the future. And to me, that's using digitization as a tool, but not an objective. And it's increasing the skill base pervasively by doing things together, yeah, rather than training. So it's more that sort of an approach. And I think we need more of it. It makes me also think, and I'd like to ask you, you know, if you take that one scale bigger, and you talk about national digitalization of, of, of for of government services, because surely that's the biggest customer base for all the population of a country. Um, how do you think governments, how well are they doing with digitalization? There's some interesting things going on. I mean, first of all, a lot of the services are a lot better. I mean, in terms of things like passports and driving licenses, yeah, so the stuff, again, the stuff in the center of the normal distribution, digitalization is brilliant. Yeah, it saves a lot of time and effort. It gives you more reliability. Yeah, it's stuff in the tails which are more problematic. So, for example, in social care, social services, if you've got anything which is slightly anomalous, you get stuck in something where, and I've been working in technology and science since I was 12. I find it bloody difficult, all right, with all the experience. So, we, we need that's where we need more human actors in the system. So, it's that sort of balance. I think, and we're also in quite advanced talks, we've got a big European Union project at the moment, um, which is designed to build narrative based culture walls for schools and for museums and for companies where people can use art to navigate knowledge. Okay? And again, the technology becomes irrelevant to the process at that point. And that also provides government with better feedback. So I think there are lots of interesting things going on at the moment, which can change this. And a lot of them are in, in the tales of a distribution where you need messy things which aren't too structured. And the danger is we over-design the process. I mean, for, give an example. One of the things we're working on heavily at the moment, and this is a big thing within the Ufield Guide, is every executive I've talked to during COVID says the thing which really worked for them was their informal networks, not the formal system. Now, there's a theoretical reason for that, is that formal systems processes assume to certain types of information transfer. So if you need different information, they're not very good at it. But informal networks are context-free information channels. So things can flow much faster through them in novel positions. So some of the work we're now doing is to increase network density on a meritocratic basis. So we can get everybody within three degrees of separation of everybody else. So we're designing ecosystems where we're designing channels for communication, which have no specific utilization except to be there when they're needed. Right? And again, that's digitization, right? And I think that that's where the value comes from government is creating systems which can handle mess. And that means a completely different approach to system design to what you see even in agile methods, because agile methods are still much too structured in what goes into them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, agile methods uh, need need uh, typically the, you you need a, a ready-made idea in order to pick it up and then make yeah. it into something. Um, I'm well. I'm a Finn, and uh, I have some experience from China, which are these two countries are uh, kind of leading 
I would say we're on the leading edge uh, when it comes to digitalization of of uh, of um, uh, government services. And uh, the difference being, perhaps in China, the government has started using started using two of the major platforms in the country, so Alipay and WeChat, and they are providing the same similar services in on, on both. And it's also it's just a limited amount of services that they are providing. Maybe you know the twenty percent that covers eighty percent of the of the use cases, yeah. and then leaving the the rest up uh, for kind of still analog analog or or the the usual methods submitting forms or going with a sheet of paper somewhere to have it rubber stamped and so on. And Finland is it's we are building our own. Yeah. But yeah, that your former minister for education is now in charge of the European baccalaureate. I was talking Something with like you the other day, and that, that's actually quite interesting because that's a recognition. And I think one of the big things in the Finnish system is that you reward teachers at higher levels of pay than most other countries. Luckily, and, and we do. That's really, really significant. And also, you don't allow, you don't have private education. Mm. If we if we double teachers' salaries in the UK and got rid of all the private schools, we'd actually have a much better society. I think you are right. Uh, formally, we we do have private schools, but they are playing on the same fields. They are accepting yeah. accepting students at the same. If they if they want to play on the same playing field as everyone else, they need to to conform to some things. But yeah, you you are entirely right. Anyone can choose a private school, and 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 basically that's that's it. You don't have to pay anything extra for it as such. Sounds like more for our forthcoming webinar on education. <laughs> Quality of God. Yeah, why not? The theme of, of uh, July, perhaps August. I, don't know. So I see we've, we've got five minutes to go, and I'd like to give a chance for each of you to make a closing statement of what do you think we should be doing um, and where you think we're going. And But perhaps we've got time for another question or two. Sophia, is there anything that you picked up? Uh, let me check. Um, there was one good question that I think you already a little bit answered about the, the um, ethics in digital transformations and are there any technological risks? Would you yeah, like I mean, eth ethics are massive. The, the risk is huge. I mean, you've now got AI bots, which, sorry, I need to be careful what I say here. It's now possible to actually target mental breakdown in key decision makers by the way you manipulate the feed of data on social media. All right, now start to think about how that starts to scale into organizational competitiveness. So the more you digitize, the more vulnerable you are. One of the things we talk about, and this is what we're doing on security, you need to increase human agency within the system because human agency is actually a better fraud detector than machines. They, they do it in different ways, but human beings will notice anomalies. It's what we evolved to do. Mm -hmm. Well, machines will only notice anomalies they've been trained to observe. So the famous thing, all right, you know, a computer can now beat a human at Go until you take away one Go piece, then the, human, the computer can't win anymore. All right, and, and that's what we need to think about. It's, this, it's a hybrid issue as well. You need human and machine intelligence. Carbon isn't silicon. Yeah, they're different. Yeah, combining the two, we can make use of the strengths, I think, of, of both. There's a, there's a couple of things that I've, I've liked uh, or picked up during this conversation, really. And, uh, and one of the things is, is, for example, that customer experiences come at the, they are outliers on the bell curve, on the Gauss curve, basically. But companies seem to target the, the big, um, the, the big, uh, uh, the, the middle, the center of, the, of that Gaussian curve. And, and um, somehow everything that is new pops up as a kind of a weak signal somehow at the end of that one of the extremes of those of those curves so um and i'd like to tie that back to to exploration and being more open and having an in companies organizations um governments those parts that are trying out new digital tools and exploring more and seeing what 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 is popping up on the radar and is this going to be so become something or is it just a, a a blip that disappears and doesn't repeat so um 
something along those lines and being more open, being more exploring. Interesting. We pick up in the feel guide. So we've got three big things you need to do in that. One is build your cross silo informal network. So I focus on communication channels, which are context free. Yeah, because you're going to need them. Yeah, and actually that's how most organizations work anyway. Um, the other is this sort of human sense network. You need to engage the whole of your workforce and customers in real time decision support. But then the other key one, which relates to what you just said, is you need to store what you know at the right level of granularity and the right level of expectation so you can map existing capability against unarticulated needs. Now, if you want to go back to history on that, IBM repurposed its ability to use punch cards to control industrial sewing machines to actually match a completely new need for computer programming. Yeah, Apple repurposed Next to create the OS operating system. Most technology advantages as a result of repurposing existing capability for something novel. And that's one of the big things. Digitization can allow you to do that, but not, you, not if you do it in the sort of structured approaches that people adopt. Yeah, and it's a bit, really important point Pamela Fox made. Um, what we can write down is about five to 10% of what we know. And all of digitization works on text. Well, when actually pictures and sound and aesthetics and metaphors and semiotics are all highly susceptible to digitization and give you much more powerful search techniques. Well, gentlemen and lady and audience, lots of food for thought. Um, it's been great having you along here this afternoon. Thanks to our two panelists. Thanks to Sophia for keeping the lights on and everything running smoothly. Um, we, those who've attended, you'll receive an email with a link. You might want to sh look at the recording again yourself or share it with a friend or a colleague. Uh, again, thank you all for being here. Thanks also, Peter, to you for asking the good questions to the panelists. It was nice. Good to see you again, Peter. Thanks for today.